New Media Comedy Worldwide Studios. New Media Comedy Worldwide presents Comedy Legacy Series with Jim Mendrinos. And now, your host, Jim Mendrinos. Hello, everybody. This is Jim Mendrinos, and welcome to the Comedy Legacy Series. We have a really fun episode for you today. Our guest is Leanne Lord. Leanne has been a stand-up in New York for a lot of years, we won't give an exact number, um, but she's also appeared on television countless times, performed in, in all over the world, um, and her style is unique, and her voice is unique, and it's going to be fun talking to a unique and very individual artist about her process and about her view on the industry. You may recognize Leanne for appearances on Def Comedy Jam, in, uh, you know, all of the cable shows. Um, straight down to, you may recognize her from her podcasts and her books. Leanne is multi-talented, multifaceted, and we have so much we can learn from her. So ladies and gentlemen, help me welcome our guest today, Ms. Leanne Lord. Welcome to the Comedy Legacy Podcast, and we are delighted to have with us uh, today a very special guest, Ms. Leanne Lord. Uh, hello. hello, good to see you. Our first time meeting, apparently. Uh, oh, well, yeah, first time in yeah, the square. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, in the square. Um, so uh, I've known Leanne for, I think I know you your entire comedy career. My was, entire comedy career, yes. Because I was on the show that DF uh, put you up on. Yes, but I also saw you the week before I went uh, up. You were the MC. Yeah, so uh, yeah, I, you are... Uh, you're doing this for many a year now. The, yeah, I mean, if you want a real number, I can give you a real number. It's just uh, my feelings. Uh, sorry about that. But let's just say it's over a decade. Easily. Easily over, over two. Over Almost two. Almost three. Uh, they, they start adding up. I'm, I'm headed to four. Yeah, I'm, I don't, I'm, yeah. I'm going to be at four way too quickly. But uh, so you've been doing this a long time. You've got a lot of it. A lot of interesting insight to give to people. I want to start um, with Def Jam. Oh, wow. Okay. And uh, here's the reason why I want to start with Def Jam. When you took the stage at Def Jam, I, I believe Mark Curry was your host? Mark Curry was my host, yes. Um, and up to that point, Def Jam had been mostly just about hip hop. Um, if I did my research correctly, Paul Mooney had made one appearance mm -hmm. prior to and uh, then you came on, but you were the first of the young comics that did decidedly socially relevant material. Um, I believe, I, I, I can't claim <laughs> to be the first, but perhaps one of, um, mm -hmm. and they, uh, they sought me out. I didn't apply or ask to audition because I didn't think that I fit, you mm -hmm. know, and they came to me intentionally because I was doing social and political material and they said that they were trying to, you know, mix things up that season at Def Jam. Okay, so now uh, the crowd reaction on that one was kind of amazing because <laughs> um, it took them about 10, I would say 10 seconds to realize they weren't getting the standard fare of jokes. Yeah, yeah, they, it, yeah, the square peg in the round hole moment, like, Rrr. And I, for, I forget which act you followed, but you were also on a pretty rough and tumble show. Yeah. 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 And it was that a function of you just stuck to your guns and just committed? Did Mark Curry do anything to make it easier for you? What, what, uh, what was the situation like? That was my first time meeting Mark. Mark did not know me mm -hmm. uh, at all. I mean, he was very nice, you know, but we didn't have a prior relationship at all. And that was me being young and dumb and just ruthlessly sticking to my guns because it's what I had. I went with what I, what I walked in with. Um, and luckily it worked. It could have easily have not, you know, but if you're going to go down in flames, go down as who you are. Now, what's always amazed me about that clip, because that is the clip that you are most known by in terms of stand-up. When I meet young comics, particularly young African-American comics, and I say that I know you, they're, they're like, oh, you've seen her Jeff Jam. Oh, she's a political girl. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is news to me. <laughs> this just in. <laughs> is that indicative of what you feel your act is? Has your act changed and morphed since then? 
Oh gosh, yes. You know, I, I look back at that set and I cringe. Um, but I think I do that with all of my sets. If I did a set last week, I'd look at it today and cringe just because the function of stand up and being a creative is that you feel like you're always improving and always doing better. Um, I, I look at that set and I was so young and so opinionated. Um, but but I, I do believe I did my best at the time. I have since given myself the freedom to not necessarily be stuck you know, doing social or political, you know, giving myself the room to grow. And then my, my point of view will just naturally um, expand on a topic. So some people still think I'm political or, or, you know, or at least giving some sort of social commentary in my comedy. But it, I, I think it's just how I, as a, as a person, as a woman, uh, as a black woman, as a creative, uh, sort of do my material, how it, you know, comes through me. Now, your style is uh, decidedly more in the Dick Gregory vein than it would be, say, in the Eddie Murphy vein? Yes, yes. If, if, we're put, if that's the scale, then yes, I, my, my slide is closer uh, to Dick Gregory for sure. And you got to meet Dick Gregory. I did. <laughs> uh, now, were you very familiar with Dick Gregory before you started stand-up? Was he one of your influences? Um, it's... it's I. For me, I think it's a little hard to to pick out. I, I was aware of him before I started stand up, and then my awareness and knowledge just grew. You know, when you start, you know, you read and you research, and you're just voracious about, you know, all the people who are funny or came before you, or you see what they're doing or they're legends. Uh, so my my I want to say my awareness of him and my knowledge of him grew as I got deeper into stand up. Mm -hmm. Now, what was that meeting like? when you finally got to meet him? Uh, I, I'm, I'm even trying to remember where, where it was. I think we were at the Black Spectrum Theater um, or it might have been the Billie Holiday Theater. At this point, I'm not sure. Um, I tried not to fangirl. <laughs> Like, let me, like, I'm going, I'm going to be, you know, uh, uh, I'm going to be normal. I'm going to be normal. Hello, Mr. Gregory. Uh, what was very helpful uh, is that he was a gentleman, you know, a scholar, a comic, and one of those guys who always seemed to be open to young comics. It wasn't, you know, the shoe shoe get away attitude yeah. he didn't have that he was always very well who's this and what are you doing <laughs> you know in in his way in his way so that has an effect i think on on young comics when you meet your legends and you meet your idols and not only are they down to earth but they're welcoming yeah you know, it makes a difference you were actually with me when i met one of my idols which was mort Saul, uh when we saw him yes in the village and we went backstage and it's, to me, always been amazing to me. And I, I've seen it when I've been with comics or in my peer group who are youngins idols and they meet them. When, you, when the idol is welcoming to the newer comic, it doesn't matter. Uh, you know, at that point, I think I'd been doing comedy about 15 years. So I was by no means new. But I met nice. Mortal and I was still, you know, fanning out. The, the amount of energy that that invigorates a young performer with from that point on yeah amazing yeah i i actually feel that way also um about franklin ajai when i got mm -hmm. to meet him and marsha warfield you know again legends to me you know as i was coming up and then to meet them and like and they wanted to meet me like marsha was a i found out marsha was a fan of mine i'm like how is that possible ma'am yeah <laughs> It really always amazed me when somebody from the generation before me knows who I am. Yeah, yeah. I'm weak on that. I should do better. <laughs> <laughs> do you, so it, decades, we've established decades. Decades, yes. V, 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 S, fake four. Do you still get excited when you create a new joke? Yes. Yes. And that's probably the only thing that keeps me in this. <laughs> <laughs> that that thrill. I mean, I wish I could show you my desk. I have these little because I've been home. I have these little uh, you know sticky notes. An idea pops in my head. Write it down. Write it, anything that's handy. There are pads everywhere in my house, and I write you know the gist of the idea down. And I can't help myself. I love that part. And then when I get to actually 
you know, flesh it out either by writing or by typing. There is a thrill to that and then expanding that and then, okay, where does, where does this fit? Where do I put this? When do I get this on stage? There's, there's nothing like that process for me. Let's talk about that process because that's pretty much what most of us are here for. Um, you've taken my dedication to writing and said, hold my beer. And <laughs> Uh, added a, a whole lot of infrastructure to it, but, yeah. you know, and I, I, when I teach my classes and people say, how do you organize material? I'm like, well, Leanne taught me. <laughs> uh, so let's talk about the, the process of how it goes from getting in your head to one of those sticky notes to in your notebook, to in your computer, to in your act. Can you talk us through that process? Yes, I can. Okay. So first, first, first and foremost, get it out of your head. You know, I, I talk about this. I've said this many times and I will repeat myself. Ideas are living jealous things. And if they come to you and you don't pay them any mind, you don't acknowledge their presence by writing them down, they will go, oh, you don't want me? And that idea will flit off to somebody else. And then a week, a month, a year later, you will see your idea coming out of somebody else's mouth as a joke or as a book or as a screenplay, and you'll go, but I had that idea first, but you didn't even do anything. You didn't do the first basic step of writing it down. You know, so you have to capture it, even if it's a word, a word, ideally a sentence, ideally, you know, what is the context? What's, what's that feeling? Because sometimes you can write down a word, you go mayonnaise, and you go, what, what, what did that mean? <laughs> so help yourself out, you know, give yourself a little more. And there's no, absolutely no reason why ideas shouldn't be captured with regularity. You know, you, there's a note feature function on your phone. You are never without the opportunity to capture an idea. So you get that idea down. Uh, you do spend some time fleshing it out. And, you know, sometimes some ideas, you know, you know, you know, pick me, pick me more than others. And I say, go with that. If you're excited about an idea, you know, you're going to spend a little bit more time with it. You're going to spend more time, you know, writing it down, flushing it out. And, you know, my mentor taught me that the first 10 jokes uh, that you write are, are the same 10 jokes the audience probably came up with in their head. Uh, that then you haven't done your job. You really, really have to keep writing and keep pushing. Like, what is that idea? Why is this funny to you? What is funny about it? What is your point of view? Because there are honestly but so many topics. You know, you could have five comics on stage talking about relationships. Uh, that should be five completely different points of view. And you almost don't feel like you heard uh, jokes on the same topic because it's from different people and different points of view. And so I, I, I spend time writing and editing and I really get down into the weeds in terms of words. You know, how, how, I'm, how many syllables are in this sentence? Do I need more? Do I need less? It's almost always less. Uh, you know, is there something alliterative about this that I could do? And I, you also, once you become an experienced comic and you know your voice, you know what words roll off the tongue you know, better than others, or you know how you're going to pause, or you know the, the, the facial expression or the, or the act out that you're going to do. So you kind of also make room for that in the writing. And then there's also then, okay, so you have a joke or you have a bit, where do you put it in the existing family puzzle of jokes? And I, I know that we differ on this. When you do a new joke, you do it right up front. <laughs> you just, you throw it to the wolves. Uh, I, not so much. Occasionally I'll do it. You know, I'm so excited and it's a joke that you have to open with. Uh, but usually I, I treat my new jokes or my new bits sort of like baby birds. <laughs> you know, I put them in the middle with the other grown up jokes. Like, I, okay, I know this works and I know this works. And then I put the new one in the middle so that, you know, the bigger kids walk the little one to school. And we'll see how it does. You know, I give it a little buffer. I give it a little protection. Um, and if it does okay, or I can at least see how to fix it or, 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 or tweak it, it then begins to move around. And how well can it stand on its own? You know, how do I help it grow? I know this is all manic. This is all very manic. No. Um, but also in terms of my, you know, set book, I, I do really do believe in writing things down. And I really do see it as movable puzzle pieces, having it in a single document. Uh, I use a word document. Uh, my bits are, I can be rearranged at any point. Uh, they are tagged uh, with, you know, the super topic, the, the, that particular joke. And I have, so that allows me to do a table of contents. So there's my active set, 
at any one point. There's new material that I'm still developing. There's old material that I'm like, ah, I don't know. I guess I should go back and rework this, but I'm not in the mood, but it's there. Uh, and then there's things that have just fallen out of the act or their ideas that I haven't completely developed that I'll put off in the back in an alphabetical section. So if I'm bored, I'm never bored, but you know, on those random times that I'm bored, I'll go, I'll say D and I'll go to the D section and I'll look at stuff that I've written, I've dumped off in the D section, you know, jokes mm -hmm. about dads or dogs or dating. And sometimes I look and I go, yeah, I should delete that. <laughs> or, or sometimes you'll have an idea and you're just not a good enough comic yet or you don't have what the, the resources to really flesh that out and I'll come back to something and fix it and then move it to the active set. And it's almost like having a brand new joke. It's very exciting for me. I don't think comics realize that enough. Who you are today is different than who you are gonna be oh, six months from now. Yes. And what you're capable of writing today is, is much less than what you're capable with dedicated effort of writing in a couple of months. Oh, absolutely. And what you get, you get distance and you get discernment. And, you know, and sometimes you're far enough away from it, you go, oh no, this is trash. <laughs> this is, this is nothing. And that's fine. Yeah. Uh, and then other times you get some living and you get some experience under your belt. And you, again, you're a different person. I'm a different comic now than I was at 25. You know, yeah. so I'm able to tackle some things uh, as a grown woman than just, hey, I'm new to adulthood. What's going on, guys? <laughs> <laughs> And for me, that lesson came because as a performer, I kept seeing myself growing. And as a writer, I always just was uber confident and I'm like, I can write anything. And then, you know, and they're like, well, logically, if this grows, doesn't that grow? You know, um, I want to talk because you mentioned a little bit about construction. Your act is, is very sneaky in terms of design. Um, you have a very classic style that is individual lines that you weave together to give the appearance of a flowing narrative. <laughs> um, Is that what I'm doing? Yeah, that's exactly what you're doing. Um, you know, a lot of times you'll have two or three jokes on the topic, but your bits are short and the way you weave them together makes it seem like they're longer in appearance. Yes, yes. Um, and uh, you, <laughs> For lack of a better way of saying it, traditionally you write like a one-liner comic. The bit comes out and you you hit the the notes, and then you structure like a storyteller. Was that some? <laughs> <laughs> was that something you did consciously, or was no. that just developed? That's developed, and that's the imagined segue. Because again, mm -hmm. like, how, what is my excuse for telling this joke? How can I? And how do I get from one joke to the other? Mm -hmm. um it, and and i won't say so what about cats you know no. <laughs> but I'll, I'll put things together uh, in terms of like families or you know or what what logically goes to the next thing and it might not be logical for you but it's logical for me like this bit will get me to this bit will get me to this bit you know if i'm talking about my parents then of course i'm going to start talking about aging if i talk about aging i'm going to talk about dating in my head that makes sense so I've strung these, you know, essentially one-liners, but I think it's more, more than that. And it sounds like a story. And that's what I feel like I'm building every time, you know, when I sit down and I create a set, how, how long is my set? Okay, if it's 45 minutes, you know, if you're headlining, you almost don't have to stress it. Um, but a shorter set takes more care. How do I get from open to close? What is that story that I'm telling? So I'm not left off at the end with an orphan you know, mm. or, or, or it feels disjointed. I like, I like for it to feel cohesive to me, you know, it, that, and that's me. And that I feel is what pulls in the audience. Now, I have a, a theory that everything you do infuses the future bits of your set in terms of the audience's perspective. So if, if your opening joke is about, you know, being a loser, then your next joke is judged with the mindset of you being a loser. And, and if your your second joke says that you you know you have a bad relationship with your parents, then your third joke is you're a loser with a bad par relationship with your parents. So that everything oh. is infused by the information we give them. Oh, so you feel it's cumulative? <clears throat> yes. Okay. So my question to you is this: because you walk on stage, very pretty, very feminine, um, and that's the first thing that the audience sees and the first bit of judgment 
and then the intelligence comes out, then the opinions come out, mm-hmm. then then each of these things come out. Do you do you sense a a, a change in the audience's perception of you from beginning to end? Do you ever try and use those emotions? Yes, I I know exactly what's going on. Uh, And it took me a while to get there. Uh, When I first started, and I don't know how much video there is of this, I was in so much denial about being a girl on stage because I wanted to be taken seriously. So I wore big boxy jackets and hats and like, ignore that I'm a girl, I'm not pretty, just listen to my words. Um, It wasn't until I got comfortable with me where I was comfortable in my own skin. Yes, I'm a grown woman, I'm gonna dress like a grown woman. Uh, and, and then I started to, I don't, I don't know if this is the right term, femme up on stage. I was tired of dressing like, you know, I just left college, like, cause it was a lie. You know, I like wearing pretty clothes. I like being, you know, uh, the, the girl, uh, the woman, the lady on stage. And walking on stage with that confidence makes a difference. You know, because they read you. They are judging you before you even get to the mic. That's all judgment. How you walk, how you look, those opening words. So I'm very well aware of that presence. Um, and, and also factoring in the advice that I, I used to get back in the day, which wasn't it, perhaps true, but perhaps not helpful, that, you know, you're not supposed to look too pretty on stage because uh, mm-hmm. a woman in the audience might think you want her man. You know, I, listen, I, honey, I don't want your man. I got Netflix and batteries. I'm fine. Um, (laughs) But I, for me, once I get those jokes out and people see that I'm not even playing into that, I'm just being myself. It allows them to relax as well. And I have had women, I remember one one woman in particular came up to me after a show and she goes, you're so pretty. You're so thin at the time. She says, I wanted to hate you. She said, but you're just, you're so nice. <laughs> like, what? <laughs> you know, she, I mean, and now the liquor helps. The, the, the liquor helps loosen tongues, you know? Like, yeah. so if she's saying it, how many women are thinking it? You know, but I'm also pro-female, you know? I, mm. I not, and that does not mean anti-male, no. you know? It def, but it definitely means pro-female. And to, and to have that, that confidence and that swagger in an industry that doesn't necessarily encourage it but does demand it because you can't be a wallflower in this business. No, you cannot be. Let's, um, let's talk a little Did business. I answer your question, by the yes, way? Yes, you did. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about the, the business because this, um, this is a very unkind business to female performers. It's a very unkind business to people of color and it's a very unkind business to people as we age. The trifecta. The trifecta. So can we start talking about, you know, what it takes to maintain a career in an environment where people are looking for excuses not to book you? Wow, how much time do we have? As much as you need. (laughs) I'm not sure how to answer that question because sometimes I'm not sure how I'm still doing this. I guess I just keep showing up because I don't have no else, no place else to go. <laughs> this is it. This is where I planted my flag. This is where I want it to be. I want it to be uh, a, a stand-up comic. That, you know, whenever I get mad at the business, whenever I want to leave, I quit every Tuesday. Uh, just because it's so incredibly heartbreaking. But I go back to that initial decision. I want to do stand-up. And then I think it was the first question or second question you asked me, um, writing that first joke. You know, when you get that idea, man, that suckers me in every time. Uh, But you also have to have an awareness. Once that first blush, that first passion, the first few years, uh, you get those first few years under your belt and you're able to see the industry uh, with a little bit more clarity. Stop expecting things from the industry it wasn't built to give you. You know, nobody is just going to suddenly discover you. You know, I, I, I mean, these are the stories that we tell ourselves, you know, oh, because it happened to so-and-so in 1987. It could happen to me. That can't be why you're doing this. 
By the way, it was there in 1987. It didn't happen. To it, did, it didn't happen. Oh, I'm going to the Montreal Comedy Festival. This is it. Maybe not. You know, understanding that the business isn't fair. Understanding that, you know, more than ever, we are in a position and, and have to create some of our own opportunities. You know, not just waiting for it to be handed to you. Um, to always, unfortunately, be working and understand the cycle. I think you're, you're one of the first pe people to teach me about the cycle. It's a circle. And there are going to be points in your career when you're on the way up and you're doing well. You are the flavor of the month. People are loving what you got. And you're at the apex of their, whoa, whoa, what just happened? What was that? Wait, wait, wait. But I was famous. <laughs> and it's in the downtime and that down part where you know, what are you working on? What are you doing? So that when it comes around again, you're ready. Oh yeah, I have this screenplay or I have this book or I have this whatever. You know, so you, the idea that you have to be continually working and developing, even when the spotlight's not on you. Yeah. If you don't have that, you can't do this. If you wait till the spotlight's on, you're gonna be like, uh, deer in the headlights. That's really not how this works. And to have, so, and to have that, you know, that self-starter tenacity. I mean, like each of us as a stand-up, we're our own startup. We're our own entrepreneur. We're our own freelancer. We're our own CEO. And I hate to put it in a business sense, but the business of this is real. Yeah, you can write jokes and have a set book, but what's your business plan? Uh, and also who's on your team? You know, I'm very much a loner and I don't do well with the team concept, but mm. it's undeniable that it works for a bunch of people. Who are you coming up with? Who are you working with? Who are your friends? Who do you hang out with? Who do you write jokes with? Who do you recommend when you, to someone when you can't do a gig? Who's recommending you? You know, so that circle of people, you know, is something I think that develops over time. And I, I think it's important to have, you know, cause those are the people whose shoulders you might cry on when you're ready to quit every Tuesday. <laughs> let's, um, <clears throat> let's talk a little bit about how the in business influences the art. Because I, I, firsthand, I've seen you, you know, have conversations with people in the business asking you to change or do something different. Mm -hmm. And you, you weigh it for all of about eight seconds <laughs> and then do what the fuck you want to do anyway. <laughs> what are you talking about? What? Yeah. So how often does industry give you opinions? How often do you choose to listen to them? I don't know. It, that industry has not exactly been knocking down my door uh, lately. Um, it's the other side of the curve. It's coming it's back. It's the other side of the curve. Yeah. And yeah. I, yeah, I don't stop working. You know, yeah. I'm still doing my thing, uh, which honestly industry sees whether they say they see or not people, you know, see what you're doing and the consistency with which you're doing it. Um, I probably don't do well in this area either. You know, I mean, I'd like to say I'm open to opinions and advice, but it has to be for people who get me, you know, or, or not. They honestly get me and they're honestly giving me advice that they think is valuable. Or are you trying to make me into a cookie cutter that you can sell like the three or four before me that you think are like me you sold? Uh, so credibility is is a thing. Uh, I will say one of the best pieces of industry advice I got was from a drunk man at a bar show in Brooklyn. Old man sitting at a bar. I was, it was my first or second year in comedy. And uh, I, this, this set was okay. It's as okay as the set's gonna be when you're a newbie. Mm -hmm. And I came off stage and the man asked me, he said, do you like what you do? And I said, yes. He goes, so how come you're not smiling? Apparently I came off stage frowning and judging. And he goes, you, you, you weren't smiling. And I, I heard it. And I'm like, he's right. If I'm not happy, if I'm miserable doing this, I don't need to be doing this. And thus, most of the video you see on me, unless I'm, I'm in the you know, world of what I'm talking about, I smile. And that has become almost a trademark for me. You know, because, and people have talked about they are enjoying not only the material, but the fact that I am enjoying myself. You know, yeah. and that brings people in. Um, I don't think that's what you meant, though, by <laughs> industry. No, by in this audience, but we'll take it. Yeah, you know, again, because you're in the position of being judged all the time. Um, I, I think that my last, you know, big industry uh, thing where that factored in 
was um, I was selected for the HBO uh, HBO Comedy Wings American Black Film Festival mm -hmm. uh, contest. Uh, I submitted, and I don't like contests, but I submitted. I got down to the semifinals. There were, I think, 10 or 12 of us, and then the uh, well, I guess the, the, the quarterfinals and the semifinals. Um, uh, there were five of us, and we flew down to Miami for the American Black Film Festival. And, you know, I felt like I'd already won just by being selected, just by going, you know, mm. and being in that industry environment. Like, you know, people are making movies. Things are happening. Woo, I'm going to be famous. Anyway, uh, what came out of that almost to a person, everybody's like, wow, you're such a good writer. And I wanted to hear I'm such a good stand up, but you know, depending on, you know, everybody has a different stand up is subjective. And I, I was surprised I got selected because I don't consider uh, myself being, when people think of a black comic, I don't think they think of me. You know, mm -hmm. they think of Monique, they think of Adele Givens, they think of uh, some more. Uh, and absolutely no disrespect to what these ladies do. I'm just not like them. And so I, I've always felt a little bit of distance uh, from the community. So my stand-up may not read to them, but my writing did. You know, folks were coming up and like, oh, wow, they, you did this. And you did. Like, they, they were in my words, you know, and that, that did feel good. But it's like, you know... <sighs> It's, that was tough for me. That was tough for me because I, and I'll also filter it through um, the, the podcast I do, People with Parents. Uh, the people who are into books say, Leanne, that should be a book. The people who are into film say, Leanne, yeah, that should be a movie. <laughs> the people yeah. who are into stage plays are like, Leanne, that should be a play. And these are all valid opinions, all based on my writing skill that I could possibly do, but then it's like, okay, well, which one do I want to do? And I'll be honest, I still haven't decided, but I also don't think those things are mutually exclusive. I could do all, you know, it's what do I have the time and the talent um, and the focus to do because each one is very specific. Yes, yes they are. And I, and I guess I hesitate because I respect the amount of work that goes into each and you don't take on those projects lightly just based on someone's opinion of what you should be doing. Let's talk about taking on uh, projects because you've had a ton of them over your career. Um, you know, from uh, numerous television appearances, I think you're you're in the dozens at least. No. Yes. I don't think so. Oh yeah. <laughs> no. Yeah. Because uh, in my it, mind, whatever the number is, I'm gonna go not enough. <laughs> I'm gonna over. think of the shows I haven't done. It's always not enough, but I bet. All right, so um, full disclosure for anybody who might not know, we were married for uh, a decade. And in that decade, I went to television tapings of yours in three countries. Oh, I wasn't counting the, the not, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah okay. So, uh, <laughs> I, I forget about those, I'm yeah. sorry. So it, it's a ton of time on TV. Yeah, um, okay. Uh, films, you know, uh, besides end of Indies and Shorts, which, you know, everyone does, uh, Radio Land Murders, which was not a small film. Um, no, it uh, wasn't you, small, but, no. No, you know, it's niche. Not a lot of people know it. True. And yeah. I have my cast photo right here, and it's like, every year, it's like, who's that chick? She's so young. <laughs> <laughs> Um, uh, you were one of the first comics in New York to write your own one-woman show, The Full Swanky, which uh, debuted at the Rion Theater, and you were nominated for what award? Um, I was nominated for and won Best Actress. You were nominated for Best Director. Yes. I did not win. <laughs> I, and I got robbed. You I should have. Robbed. You, yeah. Yes, you were, you, yeah, thievery. <laughs> thievery. Um, and, and, you know, currently, you have the People with Parents podcast. You <laughs> released how many books at this point um two that you can get in paperback uh -huh. um uh those are also available online and they're like there's several there's several ebooks and then uh, you know the ebook versions of those so yeah it's, it's several several 
Uh, <laughs> Which I will, I will add, those were projects done in the downtime. Those are projects where I was mad at the industry. Nobody was calling, you know, what's wrong with me? It, what right. was me? And I, I picked myself up with help definitely with help and i said you know what i'm gonna write a book <laughs> that's how i get mad i'm like, i'm gonna show you i'm gonna write a book <laughs> but that's probably why i have several i get mad a lot all of these things to say you, you know between stage acting and and film acting and you know the 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 writing that you're doing with books and, and stand up it do you see yourself more as an entertainer do you see yourself more as an artistic business or are you still at the end of the day a comedian who happens to do other things? That's a damn good question. Yeah. Oh, man, that's not fair. That's a hard one. Yeah. I mean, I, I feel like I, I've learned how to diversify my skill set, uh -huh. you know, but no, I'm a stand up who happens to do these other things. <laughs> now, Let's let's talk a little bit about the book writing because you know it, it might be one of the greatest fuck yous to the industry of all time. She doesn't care. They're not studying me. They're like, oh, Leanne wrote another book. We should call her. They're not thinking that. This is no. all in my mind. No, but but your bank account is thanking you, and, and you know. Yeah. The, yeah. So, with that said, and and this is a very a very big, you know, question. What does it take to sit down and write a book? Because you and I have both written books, and I don't think the public understands the amount of dedication and the amount of effort. So can you walk uh, us through a process of what your day looks like when you're writing one of these? Okay. First of all, our, our, for, between you and I, your process was really different and really more intense because you were under a deadline. Yeah. You know, you, and, and it was a close approaching deadline because you jumped in you yeah. know, for a project where someone else had dropped the ball. So I think your experience of that is way more intense than someone like me who's like, I'm gonna write a book and nobody's looking for my book. Do you know what I mean? Okay. I, 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 it, so it's a very different process. Um, I, I also think if you wanna know how to write a book, you ask Stephen King, who writes every day. Uh, but I, I, I guess I figured out my process is I start writing a book, not realizing I'm writing a book. Like, um, the dick jokes, uh, uh, alternate definitions for words you've never heard of, but will probably never forget, started as me posting a word a day, you know, just about every day on social media. You know, I would post the word, it's real definition, and then my funny definition. And I, I just came to be a habit. And then people were like, hey, that's a book. And I'm like, oh, yeah, it is. So by a word a day for like two years, I was writing a book. And then the, the process of pulling that all together. The same thing happened with Real Women Do It Standing Up. That started as a blog, you know, where I'm just posting stories every week. Because at the time, I wanted to teach myself how to blog. That's what I did. Um, then I wanted to teach myself how to podcast. That, and that came out of the Urban Irma. And then suddenly I have all these stories. And I'm like, hey, if I select these 20 or 30, this is a book about being a woman in stand-up. So I, I, I get it. I almost, it's, it's, I, if I, I feel if I said, okay, I'm gonna sit down and write a book, I would be completely stymied. But the one day at a time approach and you look up six months later, you go, Hey, and I feel that's kind of what's happening now. I do this thing now, almost accidentally. It's just things that happen that interest me. Uh, I do uh, something called on this day, uh, lighthearted history, where I take an actual fact. This is, this is what happened. And then I put a funny twist on it. Like, you know, this general marched into this place and he took over this, you know, country. And then he went home, you know, a victor. And, you know, my twist is his wife goes, you forgot the milk. <laughs> you know? um, and I guess that it's a, a trend with me. And I, I started it, I, I want to say back in, back in February or March. And I, and I didn't even recognize my own process. And I look up, I go, I'm doing the book thing again. <laughs> <laughs> By the end of the year, I'll have another book. All right. Now, it's one thing to to have an idea and to start doing it because we've all, and this is no knock on a lot of stand-ups, but we all see stand-ups, make big announcements, start a website, myself included in this, I'm as bad as everyone else. You start a project and then three weeks later, abandon the project. Yes. You yes. stick to these things. How? 
Is that I something that's learned? Is that I something? I don't know. I, <laughs> well, I guess because I don't make a big announcement. Mm. I'm just doing something that tickles me. You know, I, I started, uh, it's, I guess it's the second podcast that I started. The first one I ever started was just because I wanted to learn podcasting. I had absolutely no expectation that people would be listening. None whatsoever. <laughs> this was for my, you know, my, edu my education, my edification, and my enjoyment. Um, and then uh, to my shock, I was like, oh, there's statistics there. I could track this. People are, li who are these people? <laughs> <laughs> You know, when I, when I did the, the well, doing the People of Parents podcast, there came a point about two years ago where I, I, I was at a conference, the Irma Bombeck Writers Workshop. It's at the, the opening cocktail party. And I offhandedly mentioned that I, I thought I was, gonna, I was thinking about stopping the podcast. And this is a very dated reference. Whoever gets it, gets it. That was a very E.F. Hutton moment. I, I feel like the room fell silent and people looked at me like, what? You can't stop doing that podcast. And throughout the weekend, I had people coming up to me telling me, I listen to your podcast. This is what it means to me. You know, I'm mm. dealing with my mother, my father, my father-in-law, my grandfather, my this, my that. And I had no idea. Because if you listen to my episode zero of the podcast, I thought I was absolutely all alone. And I was just talking into the wind, um, trying to figure out what's going on in my life as I dealt with the role reversal between me and my aging parents. Um, now, is it one of the big sexy podcasts that show up in the rankings on Apple Podcasts? No. Would I like it to be? Yes. Uh, but again, part of this business is continuing to show up. Uh, you know, it's you don't make a big announcement when you go into open mics. You just keep going to open mics so that you get better, you know, so that you can make the announcement that you're headlining in such and such. You know, you build that, 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 um, this business requires so much persistence and so much steadfastness that I think that just carries over. If I could stick it out being a stand up for almost three decades, I could do a podcast for a year. I mean, come on. What are we talking about? <laughs> let's, um, let's talk about also branching out because you've also branched out into being a speaker, uh, your podcast has led to you co-hosting a, a Saturday afternoon podcast. Mm -hmm. um, shameless plug, go for it. Oh, sure. Um, I Well, I, <laughs> I got invited to be a guest on his other show. We got to talking about science fiction and he goes, hey, I, have a, I don't have a, a co-host for my Saturday show, which is Sci-Fi Saturday. And I was like, what? You need somebody to show up and talk about sci-fi? Yeah, sure. I'll do that. Um, I also got invited to, and this is actually a, a gig, uh, to co-host uh, a, a podcast called Point of Inquiry, which is the podcast for the Center of Inquiry. Now, that's a long time relationship uh, in the works because I started doing, getting invited to do stand-up shows for them. Oh, I want to say maybe around as far back as 2011. You know, I started yeah. doing shows and events for them and a very other, various other secular organizations. And so building that relationship by showing up, being funny, being confident, being competent. Uh, and so when that opportunity opened up, you know, from what I hear, um, my name was not only at the top of the list, it was the only one. Yeah. And that has to be a good feeling as well. It is. It absolutely uh, is a great feeling. Uh, but it, it's interesting. Here's... Here's what I'm not used to. I'm used to doing stuff on my own time. Like I'm, yeah. I'm writing books on my own time. I'm writing jokes on my own time. I'm booking shows, you know, whatever. Uh, not to sound cavalier at all. But when you have to show up and do work for other people, <laughs> you know, sometimes it, when you work for yourself as a stand-up or as an entertainer, you sometimes lose that discipline. So, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, I, I actually have to call some guests now. <laughs> <laughs> Let's... Um... So let's also talk about speaking because you've done a, a bunch of speaking gigs too. In fact, you you received uh, an award in 2019 or is 19, it 2019? 19. Yeah. The award was not for speaking, no. <laughs> although I did have to speak. Yes. Uh, you do my acceptance speech. Uh, that was the um, American Humanist Association gave me um, 
I was awarded the uh, Humanist of the Year, uh, Humanist Arts Award of the Year. And I, you know, I still remember that January, I, I got the email, I opened the email, I closed the email and walked away for like a week. Like, that's how I handle good news. Like when something unexpected good happens, I can't handle it because I'm so used to dealing with negativity. I'm so used to dealing with no. Like I, my muscle for how to fight back is really strong. <laughs> my my muscle for accepting good things is kind of weak. Like, oh, you you guys want me? You want to give me something? I, I'm confused. <laughs> um, my first, I feel like my first speaking gig, and I don't I don't feel like I've done a ton uh, of speaking. There are people who are way better than me in this arena, but again, it comes down to opportunities. I uh, have been invited several times to uh, perform or teach at the Irma Bombeck Writers Workshop. And, and one year they approached me and they said, hey, we want you to be the keynote speaker. And I said, what? What, what, do, you, what do you say? And <laughs> again, good news, but what do I do with this? And they said, I said, well, what do you want me to talk about? And the level of love and trust from them was amazing. They were like, whatever you want to talk about which is even more pressure. Like if they, if they had said, okay, we want you to talk about the difference between cats and dogs, I would have knuckled down, I would have studied, I would have been ready. And they were like, no, whatever you want, which is worse, worse <laughs> and better. You know, yeah. they understood you, you, when you give a creative, a creative person license to run and do, sometimes you do your best work. And I still have people, that was two conferences ago. And I have people who will tell me how that speech made them laugh, that speech made them cry, that speech made them go home and hug their mom and dad, and then start writing. Mm. And that I and I wrote from what I was experiencing at the moment. And it was about procrastination and parenting and love. And it's still one of my best pieces. Let's um let's talk a little bit about your parents, if you don't mind. Oh yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> My units. Um, we had incredibly different upbringings. Yes. <laughs> yes, we did. And uh, my parents had seen me one time perform on stage. They, each separately, not even in the same room. Because um, they couldn't stand each other. But your parents were your biggest fans and your biggest allies. Yeah, they were. Did that make it easier for you on this journey? It's hard to say that because I don't have a journey to compare it to where I didn't have them. I'm like, I haven't spent any time in my alternate timeline, my alternate universe. Uh, but I'm going to say yes, I think it did. Uh, my dad, well, they, they both were very, very supportive. Um, my dad in particular, because they were, they were both in the audience for my first show. They were both in the audience when I taped Def Jam, which, you know, uh, and my dad was kind of there for the day to day. My dad would come to an open mic. You know, my dad would show up with me at the comic strip. My dad would be with me at Caroline's. You know, I would take my mom with me when I did a weekend road gig, you know, because we could share the hotel room. Um, and yeah, I, 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 not everybody has that. And he didn't just have it for me. Like when my dad showed up at a comedy club back in the day, everybody knew him. <laughs> like they would talk to him he would talk to them because my dad had that mindset he had he didn't have a scarcity mindset he really felt the, the more love you gave away the more you got and that was genuinely who he was so, so he was genuinely happy for what I was doing and the life I was living and he he wanted me to he wanted me to travel more than I wanted me to travel, you know. So I, I got so much of his wonder wonderlust wonderlust. Um, so I feel I feel very lucky, very supported. Felt very supported. And your um, your dad had come with you to shows, right down to when you headlined at the Apollo the last time. Um, well, I didn't, I didn't headline. I, they were doing the Apollo uh, Comedy Club and I got booked for that. And um, that was actually, um, it's the last show I brought them to. And it was wonderful. You know, I left, we left the house, the show was at eight. We left the house outrageously early because I had to find parking. And by then he was, you know, walking on the with the cane and it took forever to get up the block. <laughs> you 
you know, and my favorite part was we're walking up the block and my name flashes on the marquee. And I said, daddy, 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 do you see? And he said, yeah, baby, I see. I didn't even have to do, if I didn't do a show that night, I wouldn't have cared because just that moment where he got to see my name in lights on, on the marquee of a venue that means so much, you know, in the history of, of entertainment. That was just so huge. But, you know, I, I thought that was gonna be the greatest moment, but then bringing him in the building, the staff, oh my gosh, they just took him over, you know, cause they knew I had a show, you know, I'm worried about doing the show. And I did not have to worry about him. They made sure that he was taken care of backstage. He had a seat, you know, they were bringing him stuff. I mean, they just really took care of him for me. And yeah. then I did my show, my spot, and I got off stage and my dad, I don't know when I've ever been hugged harder. My dad hugged me so hard it hurt. And so that whole night was just wonderful. And we took pictures and it was, it was actually a good set. You know, he got to see me, you know, do well. Um, but I also knew in the back of my mind, like this is the last show I get to bring him to because it got too hard. Cause he got, you know, it, it, he was an old man by then. And it was difficult to, um, to drag him out. You know, usually yeah. he would just show up at the club. You know, we weren't at show up at the club times anymore. Yeah. And and so I know it was a lot of effort for for him to come out. And I couldn't keep doing that. And I think that was a good show to go out on, you know. Yeah. It it kind of I I feel as if it was the show that said thank you for all the support. Thank you for all. Thank you for believing in me. I, I wished it had been, you know, a TV show and a mansion, you know, that I could have said, hey, daddy, look, but, you know, this wasn't bad. No, not at all. And um, one of the most amazing things that, you know, I, I got to see with your dad, um, because your dad was a printer. Yeah. And your dad was way into tech before other people were into tech. <laughs> Yes, he was. Um, so just full disclosure, I was about 30 years younger than him, and he would show me how to fix my computer. Yeah, um, my, so, my dad was my geek squad. So with all this said, from an early time, you embraced the, the contact with your audience. And I think you got that with your dad from the early newsletters that, that oh, uh, yeah. you and your dad would design straight through to when technology took over one of the first people with a website, you know, then, you know, when social media took over, you're incredibly active in social media, you know, how has that benefited you as a comic being in touch with your audience? Oh, um, I think that's absolutely key. And it's, it's funny you say that because I think I could be even doing better at it. Uh, than I am, but that's, I guess that's just me. Um, but I had almost forgotten about that. Yeah, from the very early days, I did newsletters. I collected people's actual physical addresses. <laughs> I would mail them newsletters. I would mail them postcards. You know, this is the show I'm doing. You know, as we transitioned to more email, you know, I get their emails and uh, yeah, I've had an email list for ages. It should be bigger than it is. Because uh, there were times when I was good with it and times when I wasn't, you know, to be honest, because you have to be consistent um, and and not be a pain in the ass. You know, you don't email people all the time, you know, but when it's something um, that they might be legitimately interested in, uh, I think it's important to keep an email list separate from your social media presence or in addition to your social media presence because social media changes. You don't own that. You know, I mean, how many people were rocking out on MySpace and now what you got, you know, and then the rules on the platforms change that may not be advantageous to you or might not give you as much access to your fan base as you might have previously enjoyed and you don't have any control over that. Um, but so that said, I've had people who have been my fans for years uh, and I sometimes forget that. 
you know, somebody was, I, I love the pictures people send me, they're cleaning their houses and they find newsletters <laughs> that I've sent them or postcards that I've sent them or t-shirts that I used to sell at my shows. I remember when um, I went in for my first meeting, my first face-to-face -face with the head of the commercial department at Paradigm, that's my commercial agent, um, Doug Keston. And uh, we're sitting, we're having a loving conversation and he takes out a folder he opens it up and inside the folders, not just my headshot and resume, but postcards that I had mailed him that he kept. <laughs> like what? So he had been watching. He had, when I got brought in for that meeting, he knew who I was, you know, and not just somebody who said, Hey, you should take a look at her. Um, there was, there was some substance there and some consistency there, which I think social media allows you to continue to do. Um, in terms of, of building and maintaining a fan base uh, on, on the platform that you think is helpful or relevant for you. Because not everybody needs to be on everything. You know, the question is, where are your fans? Where are your fans? Where is the industry that you want looking at you? Because I still take classes in this stuff. When I don't know something, when I told you I wanted to learn how to blog, so I started a blog, I wanted to learn a podcast, a podcast, that mentality has not changed. I just recently, it was a week ago, I took a class on how to do social media for artists uh, taught by, oh, I can't remember her name, but she's really good. She has a YouTube page because I'm always trying to get better. I'm always trying to improve. How do I, because social media is changing. How do you keep yeah. engaging? How do you keep staying relevant? Um, I even took a class how to do LinkedIn for performing artists because, you know, so many artists I know are like, well, I'm on LinkedIn, but I don't know what I'm doing. That's the business, love. How do you not know LinkedIn? You know, and you can get a free class on it. I mean, it's, you know, it, but it's also choosing where you spend your time and, and how you want to develop that end of it. It's a lot of work. Now, one of the themes that keeps coming back in our conversation is your willingness to learn, your willingness to research, your willingness oh, yeah. to do the work. Comics have a reputation at times for being incredibly lazy with their craft. And some of us are. Some. 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 But most of the, well, a lot of the comics I know are hard workers. We are worker bees. I, I will also say this. All of the successful ones I know are hard workers. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know any lazy dumbasses that, that are. That... I feel like I know one or two. <laughs> I feel like there are one or two that got lucky. And it's like, you got no work ethic at all. What are you doing? Okay. <laughs> All right. But it's not, not the majority. You're right. It's not the majority. You, when you see somebody hit or see somebody get an opportunity, as hard as it is, you cannot begrudge them. How much work went into that? How many no's did they get? How long will this opportunity continue to work for them? This is such a, 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 a come and go industry that when somebody enjoys some success, you have to root for them. Because how long will they have it? And how long did it take them yeah. to get there? And how long will they stay there? Yeah, that, that, is, all, that is all incredibly true. Yes, now, but I, you, you, to your point but, before that, I apologize. The willingness to learn and grow. Do you think that that has been one of the reasons why you not only been working consistently throughout your career, but one of the reasons why you stay relevant, you're still known to the younger generation of comics, whereas a whole lot of people that started from you have faded into obscurity. You know? And I feel exactly the opposite. I, you know, I was talking about this in another interview where um, the barometer for me are the comedy club holiday parties. Like I go and it's like, who are all these comics? And all of a sudden now I'm in the corner with the older comics and we're all going, who are these youngins? <laughs> like, that's how I feel. Like, where did all these new people come from? Uh, but I also do get the folks that they come up to me and they talk to me like they know me. And I'm like, did we work together? And no, and a lot of times, like you said, it's Def Jam. A lot of times it's tough crowd. Yeah. The show that I had absolutely no business on, absolutely no business doing, but something, you know, I rolled up my sleeves and said, this is not me, but I'm doing it. And then how many years later, I still get people going, you're on, you're, you're on Tough Crowd. Like, <laughs> like this, this show is older than you are. How are you watching this? 
Well, the same way they're going to watch this video for YouTube. Right. Yeah. Uh, the, um, which that does bring up a, a certain point and a disconnect. Um, we're going to touch on age for just a second, and I'm sorry about that. But there's a disconnect for us as we get older. I remember being at the comic strip Christmas party, um, and this is in the 90s, and I'm talking to Dennis Wolfberg, and a young comic comes up to us and talks to us, you know, as if we're the oldest friends on the planet. And then he walks away and Dennis goes, do you know who he is? And I went, no, do you know who he is? And I remember him saying, well, you know, that's the cycle. You know, they know us, we don't know them. Right. You know, we'll know the ones that get through. Yes. I, I almost feel, I say it jokingly, but I feel it's almost true. If you haven't been doing this 10 years, I don't know who you are. And it's just the turnover is too much because everybody starts with, you know, the best of intentions. Um, and we've seen so many people, I'm sorry, just drop something. You see so many people flame out or just not have what it takes to, to stay. And it's not always the funniest people who stay. No, it's you know, not. Because it takes more than just being funny. You have to also be fearless. And a lot of people don't have that. Not at all. Uh, I want to talk about influences and then your early running buddies. Who oh, are the goodness. Uh, who I, the I feel like I didn't answer your question two questions ago about um, feeling like an inf like it, how you affect other people, like younger, younger comics. Did I answer that sufficiently enough? Well, you, you gave an answer, but if you want to elaborate, we'd love to hear more. Um, no, I'm not. I, I, w I would even need you to restate the question because it was a good question and I feel like I jumped past it. But well, if you... <clears throat> don't, don't even worry about it. Let, okay. let that moment go. We're on okay. to the next one. Um, but I, I will say this. Does it still amaze you that you're still relevant after all this time to the younger generation? And I don't feel relevant. That, that was actually the question. I don't, mm -hmm. I don't feel... I, I feel irrelevant half the time. Um, but feelings aren't facts. No. And I say that because sometimes you forget how people see you. And I say that to say I was trolling on, not trolling in a good way um, on Instagram. And I saw a young lady who uh, I see her on Instagram a lot. She was going live. She was doing an interview. And I said, okay, let me pop in. And I popped in, you know, I didn't expect anything. She stops the interview. Hey, Le Leanne Lord's in the room. Leanne, she's so funny. She's this, she's that. And I'm like, we've never met like i got couldn't i couldn't believe the level of love or and the shout out that she gave me i'm over here thinking i'm all anonymous in my my bunker <laughs> you know nobody knows what i'm doing nobody's yeah. paying me any mind and i'm surprised who is paying you mind or who is aware uh, of what you're doing or when you're being cited as an example you know, I've had young comics come to me and said, oh, so-and-so told me to talk to you about how to set up my set book. What? <laughs> oh, somebody asked me to come to you. So how do I get on cruise ships? How do I do this? Because I've had a, I forget how long my career has been. Yeah. Me. And what I've done. Um, so, I, yeah, I, I, I have to get out of my head because a lot of times I'm feeling irrelevant. Uh, but the pace of things are so fast. Yeah. It is. You know, that it's, it's easy to feel like you're swept away. And that's when it's even more important to continue being consistent and doing the work. Yeah. Now, there's a generation uh, before us, uh, many generations before many us. Many generations before us. That kind of inspire us to do it. Like, I always loved stand-up, but then I saw Freddie Prinze and I went, I, uh, that's what I'm doing the rest of my life. Yeah, you yeah, know? yeah. Um, and then when I got into stand-up, I had a lot of great comics just grab me by, you know, the scruff of my neck and go, mm, okay, let, let's show you a couple of things. Yeah. Um, Kennison's the one that I'm probably most associated with, but even people like Barry Berry, who literally sat me down one day and went, show me how you write jokes and fixed my process. Wow. Yeah. So who are the people that influenced you to get in here and then once you were in the game, who were the people that helped shape you? Wow, so many people. You know, 
I, I've, I've taken to under finally understanding that you might stand on stage by yourself, but you are not alone in this business. Um, in, in the sense of your development, uh, very early on, uh, I found Rob Weinstein, who used to teach classes at the comic strip. And Rob's method of teaching really aligned with my type A personality. And I thrived in his classes. He had uh, three levels. It was comedy boot camp, um, front line was the last one, and there was a one in the middle. And then he eventually asked me to start teaching for him. And I'm like, I'm still new with this. He goes, yeah, but you're good. And when you teach, you learn, you know, cause you have to know this stuff. You have to embody this stuff and it reinforces it. And it was one of the best lessons uh, I could have gotten. And I cannot tell you how strongly I believe in the foundation that Rob laid for me. And then I was smart enough to listen to, you know, and I share those concepts still, you know, open strong, close strong, tell a joke 100% or don't tell it at all. You know, write, 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 edit, 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 cut the fat, cut 50 words. You know, so many of his concepts, I, I literally still do today. So that was just, he, his teaching and his guidance was so foundational for me. He also believed in me enough to recommend me to his college agent. Uh, that was DCA at the time. <laughs> yeah, we're going back. And I met with them and was stunned to find out that, you know, doing colleges, you had to have an hour's worth of material. I had maybe 15 minutes, maybe. Like, I don't even know why Rob recommended me. It was, I was, it was way too soon in my career. But what they did for me, I guess they saw something too. Uh, they said, what we're going to do is we're going to send you out to open with some of our bigger acts. And in the meantime, write, start writing. So that put me in the clubs a lot. I mean, I was going to be there anyway, but now yeah. I had a goal. I had a, I had a, you know, a, a purpose and this, I don't know how long it took, but I got that call one day, one of their big acts, um, Renee Hicks got sick and she couldn't fulfill her contracts. Now understand those contracts, as much as they mean to a comic, they mean a lot to the booker or to the agents as well, because they got, what was, I think it was 20% 20%. back then for colleges. Uh, so this was not an, and she had quite a few shows. Um, th that would have been a big loss. And so they called me they said, you're on. And I'm like, what? I only have 45 minutes. They're like, you're fine, go. <laughs> yeah. I got, I, yeah, and it's, it was, it, it, no, I don't recommend that. Um, and I was scared. I was scared for like my first 10 jokes. Uh, but I got better. I got better and I got stronger. And at the time I was known as a, as a college comic. You know, I spent years doing that. Uh, seems so long ago. Okay. Yeah. Um, so long ago that I even forgot the question. <laughs> <laughs> who, who were the people that inspired so, okay. you to try stand up, and then who were the people that helped you once you were in the game? Okay, so okay, so Rob Weinstein was definitely you know foundational and inspirational, and helped mold and shape and push. Um, who got me into stand up? Jeez, who didn't? <laughs> I was that I was that kid, you know. I'm popping channels. There's a brick wall. Okay, that's what we're doing. And I remember watching comedy that I didn't even always understand, like Dennis Miller. What is he saying? But it just felt really smart. Like I felt I was learning something. Like I'm gonna have to research this joke and research your references, and I'll laugh a week later. But I, I that resonated for me because I was I was that kid that read Doonesbury. Like I learned politics through reading Doonesbury. <laughs> so I, I didn't mind learning with my entertainment. Uh, so, so of course, so watching Marsha, Marsha, watching Marsha Warfield on TV, she was the first black woman uh, that I saw do stand up on television. And it, it occurred to me like, oh, oh, we could do that. <laughs> um, but I will say the person that really pushed me over the edge that was like, yes, I want to do this was uh, Michael Collier. Uh, might not be a huge household name, uh, but he was one of the acts that I saw on the very first time that I went to see Def Jam. One of the, it, it, the, it was the debut they were recording. I believe it was at the Academy Theater, um, and Michael Collier came out, 
and he had this really funny joke. He had this poise, he had this confidence, he had this really funny joke that the timing was very important on the joke and he was willing to stand and wait for the audience to get it. And the beauty of that, to, to have him pause with total confidence, have the audience hear what he said, understand it, and then reward him in mass with a huge reaction. I was like that. I want to do that. Because I was right there in the middle of trying to figure out what to do with my life. I was at a job I hated. Um, I was taking classes in anything and everything from the learning annex going, what do I want to do with my life? And went to see Def Jam and I'm like, the, the, the recording of Def Jam. So Michael Collier do that. I'm like, I want to learn how to do that. All right. And then final final question uh and and hopefully you know you have uh, as much insight as you can what what do you wish you knew when you started out that you know right now so much uh, i wish I had known, really known, how unfair the business is. Uh, how your reward might not ever equal your effort. And that you have to be okay with that or find something um, that will match it, that will reward your effort. Um, I wish I had understood that stand-up didn't come with a retirement plan. Um, I understand the decisions that I made when I made them, but I wish I hadn't put so much of my personal life on hold pursuing this. And I pursued stand-up with gumption and gusto, and I guess I don't regret that. And I might, I might feel better about it if I had more to show for it. Um, but I do think I let some personal things slide that I wish I hadn't. Uh, I, I, although I did make an effort um, to go, I want a normal life. You know, I want friends, you know, um, and, and did that. But I wish I had done that more. I wish I'd been braver. You know, as, I thought the bravest thing I ever did was going up on stage to do stand up. Uh, but this industry requires. Uh, you making brave choices uh, all the time. Like, I wish I'd gone out to L.A. when people told me to go to L.A. Mm -hmm. You know, that's one of my big regrets. Uh, I Yeah, and that... Um, I, I, you know, I think that's, you know, th those are, those are the, the, the big things, of, you know, what I wish I had known. I wish I'd, 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 I talked about it and, and, and from a retrospective point, uh, I wish I'd spent more time building community with people instead of being such a loner. Because um, oh. I think that matters. I think that matters more than ever. And you know, there are some people, you know, that I count in my corner, but I should have a bigger corner. <laughs> Do you still love performing? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Man, listen. So much so, I listen, I've built a little curtain and a stage here in my house. I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm doing jokes on, on the internet, not hearing laughter. How, how much do I like telling jokes? But yeah, the, the, the feeling of walking into a venue. I did a show, I did a show, it was last year. Um, I'm blanking on the comic's name right now, but we happened to pull into the parking lot at the same time. His dad was with him. And, you know, I, I got my, my equipment, my merch. He's got his stuff. We're walking up. It's like this country club. And his dad is like, so, so wait, you guys have never been here before. We were like, no. He goes, so you don't, you don't know how this is going to turn out. We were like, no. <laughs> and he couldn't, his dad couldn't wrap his mind around the fact that this is what we do. Like, I, we know, okay, we, here's, the, here's the booking date. Here's the time you show up. You walk in, you do some jokes, you leave. And you are never going to see these people again. <laughs> like the uncertainty of that blew his mind whereas that's my normal i i have no problem walking into the lion's den and like okay yeah where's the mic where's the stage can we do a sound check i tell students all the time in stand-up we're the consistent 
everything else is the variable. Yeah. yeah. And, and that's literally everything else. Right down to, you don't know from minute to minute how that sound system is going to operate. No. Yeah. So where can people find you on social media if they wanted to, to join the Leah and Lord fan, fan base or even find a way into your corner? Where would they find you? <laughs> Oh, thank you for so much for that. Um, my website, which is the portal to all things me, is veryfunnylady.com. Uh, and of course, my, my, my website website is leannelord.com, but Very Funny Lady is even a nod to the reality of stand-up. How, you know, people will see your show, but they've had two drinks minimum, maybe three, and they like you. And as much as they like or love you, they can't remember or spell your name by the end of the night they could spell very funny lady, you know? So again, a nod to uh, the convention of what the industry is. Uh, but I am on Instagram, uh, Leanne Lord. I am on uh, Twitter. I have a very active Twitter life. Facebook as well. Uh, that's Leanne Lord Comedy. That's my fan page. And my YouTube channel, which, you know, if I have to say, if I have a, a industry regret, it's not paying more attention to my YouTube channel. It was just there. You know, I wasn't actively doing anything. Uh, but I am now. I, I am posting videos on a regular basis. And that's Leanne Lord Comedy as well. And I, I will say, I will go out on a limb and say that if you are following me or will follow uh, on any of those platforms, uh, you will be rewarded because I strive every day uh, in the content that I provide to be enlightening and entertaining. That's what I bring, and that's what you'll get. All right, and you know what? I can, I can vouch for that. I can absolutely <laughs> vouch for that. Leanne, it's been a pleasure having you on the show. Mm -hmm. uh, hopefully, uh, if, if these work and people actually listen to this damn podcast, we will have you back for part two. I would love that. Thank you. You're welcome. Talk to you soon. That was a wonderful conversation. We touched on so many things from the business to the art to just a pure amount of passion that one has to go through to, to motivate themselves to do this again and again and again. If we've learned one thing from this conversation, it's that in order to be a comedian doesn't just require talent or dedication, it requires perseverance. It requires the ability to take the body shots the business can give you, lift yourself off the mat, and keep on keeping on. We're going to be back next week with another wonderful episode. Today's episode with Leanne Lord is something that you can also find on our podcast pa uh, partners. You can get it on iTunes as well as any place you find your podcasts, um, or you can watch it every Monday on YouTube for another episode. Until our next episode, we'll see you around, guys. This has been a new media comedy worldwide production.